Good morning, Wellspring. So great to see each and every one of you. Let's all stand and join together in worship. Sing us together. What can wash? What? Father, we worship you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your great gospel. Pray for your blessing over the service as we have baptisms, we have communion, Lord. Bless your ordinances this morning. Be with us this morning as we hear from your word as well. Such a packed service, such a glorious time, Lord. We love you. Be here with us. And we ask this in your name. And everybody said, amen. Let's take some time and greet each other this morning. Sing us out. How deep the Father's love how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a rich his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the father turns his face away, has wounds which mar the Chosen one, bring many sons to glory. Behold the men upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders, a shame.
boast. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Do you feel? Do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen? Do you know that all the dark will stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that we could see?
Sing it out.
beautiful, beautiful. Let's pray. Lord, receive our worship this morning. We mean it. We sing it. For those of us who don't mean it, Lord, work in our lives and our hearts to mean these words, Lord. Pray that you would work in us, Lord, work in our minds to worship you and to learn how to worship you better every day, Lord. Let us take it as seriously as our jobs, as our pursuit in life, as our health. Lord, we must worship you rightly. So, Lord, I just pray that you inspire love and reverence in our hearts to you, to your word, to your spirit. Lord, now as we transition to hearing from your word, Lord, I just pray you would change us. Do a mighty work in us that only the word can do through your spirit, Lord. Teach us, shape us. Turn us more into an image of you, Lord. Let us look more like Christ each and every day, Lord. But now as we are corporately gathered, do a work in your bride. We love you, Lord. We just wanted to look more like you in our daily lives. So help us in that endeavor, Lord. Be worshipped this morning. Lord, we just pray that you would be glorified. We love you, Lord. We ask these things in your name. And everybody said, amen. Good morning, saints. My name is Rob Johnson. I'm going to be doing the reading, the scripture reading for this morning. That's going to be in James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, out of the ESV. If you are using one of the, one of the Bibles in the, in, under the chair in front of you, it's going to be page 1201. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Give everybody a moment to get there. James 3, verses 13 through 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. God add his blessing to the reading of the word this morning. Thanks, brother. Good morning. morning. Let's open the prayer. Father God, we just ask you to be over this morning. It is a blessing to gather as your people, your church, the body of Christ, to honor you, to worship you, to praise you in song, Lord, for thou art worthy of all of these things. And so what a joy it is to corporately gather together and to be able to do that. For those joining us online, Lord, we just pray that you'll be a blessing to them as well. Father, we ask for you to be in and through the teaching of your word today, that we will learn from it, be corrected by it, be encouraged by it, Lord, to serve you, to glorify you, to honor you with the days that we have. We see the nature of the world around us the foolishness of the world around us, the direction of the world around us. God, we are so thankful that thou art in control over all of these things, that you are sovereign, and that your perfect will is being accomplished even around us, even through the wickedness of mankind. Thank you for calling a people out of the world to be your church. Thank you for calling me. Thank you for calling each of these saints out of the world to be the light of the world, to to worship and to honor you in the world as we serve you, Lord. Lord, I pray that we will be equipped and encouraged to do that rightly and to bring glory to your name. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. So for those of you who are guests today, I am Craig Kenny. I'm one of the associate pastors here at the church. Um, I have the privilege of being able to teach us through James 3, verses 13 through 18. As James is talking to us about words of wisdom, we're talking about wisdom today. Uh, here in verse 13, he says this, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. So where are my wise people at? I need to know. I want to know exactly. Because if you're not raising your hand, I know who I need to teach to. So, all right, so that's pretty much everyone else. Okay, good. So we got a lot of ground to cover. Yeah, I'll say, you know, when somebody says, you know, well, who are the wise people? We all want to raise our hand and go, well, yeah, I'm wise. I'm smart. I'm, I have understanding. I, I know how things work around me. I make wise choices, right? 
Uh, I can tell you that there have been times in my life where I was convinced that I was wise and knew exactly what I was doing. I remember being a young man and a group of us took a bunch of 22 shells and pulled the lead bullets out and we filled them with wax and decided we would go up and invent paintball on our own before that came out. We thought to ourselves, I mean, it's only wax, how much can it hurt? The answer was, a lot. <laughs> what seemed like a great plan and very wise in our own eyes was, uh, turned out to be complete foolishness. Uh, I can tell you, I do not doubt God's grace because I'm living proof of it. And so, you know, there's, there's a certain way when we process data, the knowledge that we have, and we come up with these plans and schemes and how we're going to apply these things, and God's going to tell us you know, that he wants us to apply the wisdom and knowledge, the knowledge that we have from his word to our lives, and have understanding. And it's not that we need to have a complete understanding of everything that goes on, but we need to have an understanding of the totality, the grasp of what God is doing. Kind of like microwaves. I mean, I don't understand exactly how they work. I understand you can put corn seeds in there, hit the, button, the popcorn button, and two minutes later I get popcorn. I don't understand exactly how that happens, but the point is, is I understand that there's a process there and it occurs, and I, and I can use that wisely. You don't want to put organic material in there, right? Boys, that's for the younger kids and who are still contemplating that, that, that measure of action. It's not wise. So he says this here, uh, what is James talking about as we, as we talk about who is wise among us? Who has understanding among us? So if we're going to talk about wisdom and knowledge and, and understanding, we need to put some definitions to these so we understand them. So let's just define some of these terms. What is knowledge? Well, knowledge is just information. It's what you know. And then there's understanding, uh, which is the meaning of that knowledge, or how well you comprehend what it is that you know. And that leads us to wisdom, which is the application of, of that which you know. Uh, but it, to be true wisdom, it has to be prudent. So then we have to identify prudent, because most of us don't use that term a lot. And so to be prudent is to use sound judgment, something I have failed in miserably at times in my life. Uh, but when we use the knowledge that we have and we apply it prudently uh, regarding the decisions that we make in such a way that they benefit us, then this is considered wisdom. And so then this is contrasted with foolishness, uh, which is to be a fool or to be unwise or to imprudently use that knowledge. That is to say that we all are working with the same knowledge. If you use it correctly and wisely, prudently, that's wisdom. If you use it imprudently such that it would cause harm, that's foolishness. And then finally is ignorant, which is to simply be lacking in knowledge. There's a reason why we proclaim God's word, why we come and we teach and learn and go to God's word, because we do not want to be ignorant of the truth. We want God's word in our lives, to be spoken into our lives, and to declare it and proclaim it to the world around us, so that our friends and neighbors and our loved ones will not be ignorant of the truth. Now, once we get this knowledge to them, now this is where the Holy Spirit begins to work. We pray that he will reveal that knowledge to their heart and that they will be able to apply it prudently, wisely to their lives. So at some level, James is asking here, he says, who among you has the right understanding of God's word and is able to apply it rightly, which would be wisdom? But this is a deeper concern than just simply stating that because any one of us at a core level could say, well, yeah, sure, I've read it. I understand the words that are written for me here in English. They've been translated. I understand that language. And so, yeah, I have understanding and I can apply it. The problem is, as it has been in the past, is today and will be in the future, that there are too many, so many out there that will take this same work of knowledge and misapply it, misrepresent it or not understand it rightly. And some do this out of ignorance, some do this out of foolishness, and sadly, some do this out of wickedness, to their own destruction, and sadly, many leading others astray as they apply wrongly this work of God. And this isn't something new for us. Jesus warned that there would be false teachers. Paul, in the first three chapters of 1 Corinthians, warned that there would be divisions in the church because of the misapplication of knowledge, because of a lack of wisdom, out of a lack of, of prudence, if you will. In 1 Corinthians 1.10, Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. And so then what he's saying is, is you know, we need to have a unity. God is, God is so focused on, on the church body, 
having unity with itself. And that Paul saw this as such a, 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 a necessary appeal, that we have unity with one another, that he invokes this, I appeal you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says. Have unity, as we are united, being of the same mind and having the same judgment. Now, unity is not uniformity. That doesn't mean that we agree on every single matter of doctrine. But there are some core things we do have to agree on. Charles Spurgeon once wrote of his love for a man named George Herbert, who was a child-baptizing Angelican who had various theological disagreements with Spurgeon. And while Spurgeon was fully willing to, to engage with him on these theological disagreements, he wrote of the man, I cannot help myself unless I can leave off loving Jesus Christ. I cannot cease loving those who love him. And so even though they had some theological differences, he says, I love this guy because of his love for God. And that's where we need to find ourselves too, is, is having love for the brothers and sisters in Christ who love Jesus. God so loved us. We have to love one another and work through these disagreements. And, and it has to be focused in love. God is love. And if we're the children of God, if we're the family of God, then love ought to be a pillar that others can see in us. Not only in the world out there, but also here in our own halls. As we love one another and be obedient to our Heavenly Father, that we must be motivated by love to seek this unity and understanding of what it is that God is teaching us, that we can apply it rightly and have wisdom. Because if we do it with a different motive, if we don't do it out of love, then 1 Corinthians 13, 1 says, If I speak with tongues of men and of angels but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. You can make a bunch of noise. But if it's not from love, then what's the motive? What's the fear? If it's not from love, then what it might very well be from is a sense of pride or arrogance or some other emotion or some other state. And if we're going to be true disciples of Christ who loved us so much, then we must manifest love to one another. Colossians 3.14 says, Above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. That's where our harmony comes together. That's where our unity comes together. Loving one another. Even loving one another as Christ loved us. This was the commandment that Jesus gave to his apostles. A new commandment I give to you, he says, that you love one another as I have loved you. By this all men will know that you are my disciples and how you love one another. So, again, it's focused in love. A love first for God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and a love for our neighbors as we love ourselves. Even so, as we seek for that unity, that unity that we come together with this, that, that Paul was talking about was being like-minded. And to be like-minded, we have to have the knowledge that God has given us and understand that knowledge and to apply that knowledge. How else, if, if we don't have a right understanding of what God is teaching us, of who God is calling you to be. And understand, every single one of you here today, God is calling you to a purpose, to serve him in the earth, on the earth, in all the days that he has given to you. We're not just wandering through here as aimless Christians. We have a purpose. We have a mission that we've been sent here. God's called you for a reason. And if we don't have knowledge, if we're not being wise in our walking and understanding in God's word, then how else are you going to fulfill your position as an ambassador for Christ? I love this image that he gives us as ambassadors, because we get it. We understand what an ambassador is, right? This is a person who's been sent from one kingdom to another kingdom, has been sent from, from their land to a foreign land to represent their king to a foreign country and the interests of their kingdom to a foreign country. Here in 2 Corinthians 5.20, we read, Therefore we, you, are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. People say, you know, man, somebody needs to tell that person about Jesus. God says, yes, yes, they do. I chose you. Go. And it, we're so easy to say, you know, somebody needs to go do that. If you're a somebody, please raise your hand. You are an ambassador for Christ. God has sent you into this foreign land. We don't live here. This isn't our land. We are just passing through, Amen. He says in Psalms 39, 12, I am a sojourner on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. This isn't our home. This is our missions field. This is where we are serving our great king. Someday, God will call us home. Until then, we need to be about our father's business. So then, 
this question he asks us, you know, who then is wise and has understanding, it's not a light question. Who of us is ready, prepared, and equipped to go out there and to serve our king as an ambassador for Christ? He goes on, he says, if you're, to talk about standing firm and to hold fast to these truths. Uh, understand that as you go forth and you serve God, you are serving with an enemy in this land. First of all, the land itself is an enemy to God. The natural state of man is an enemy to God. And Satan and his demons are out there willing and eager to devour all who he may. And so if we're going to stand strong against the lies and the worlds and the scheme of the devil, if you're going to proclaim the gospel, even the gospel that saved you, we've got to have wisdom. We've got to have understanding and knowledge and discernment of the word of God. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 2, Paul says, Now I would remind you, brothers, it's good to be reminded. Or at least my wife's convinced that it's good for me to be reminded. We need to be reminded of things. Okay? And Paul says, I would like to remind you, brothers, of the gospel. Anybody here need a reminding of the gospel? Yes, yes we do, every day. We need to be reminded every day of what it is that God has done for us, that we can honor him rightly and love him and serve him rightly. So Paul says, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you. Unless you believed in vain. Hold. Stand fast. The world is a dark place, and it's not getting any brighter. But we are told to stand firm, to hold fast. How are we going to do that? How are you going to stand fast and hold firm in a world gone mad, filled with the wickedness of man, who is turning against God, turning against the followers of Christ? How are you going to do that if you're not standing firm, holding fast in the truth of God's word with understanding? Therefore, if, if wisdom is coming from, from the heart, okay, and, and, and the attitudes of the heart come from the mind and are discerning and understanding, it's to know and to understand God's word, you can't be lazy about understanding, learning, and growing in the knowledge of God in what he has taught us from his word. Cannot be lazy about these things. We are not plants. We don't osmotically bring in nutrient. We have to go get it, okay? We, the nutrients that we take into our bodies, we have to go. We have to feed ourselves to be able to take that nourishment and that nutrient in. God's word, the knowledge of God's word, the understanding of God's word is not going to just happen. You have to go out and seek it and spend some time studying it and growing in it. Did you know at this church we have theology classes going on? Been happening for several years now, Theology 101, 102, 103. You're growing in an understanding, starting off with some basics and then moving on into more advanced studies. Here at this church, at this church, at this church I'll say that in English. How many of you have not yet enrolled in one of those classes. Why? Did you know that at this church, we started off uh, this year uh, making this, this decision as a church that we were going to read through the Word of God in a year, which is a common thing. People say it all the time. We said, you know what? We're going to commit to this as a church. We're going to read through the Bible in a year. How many of you have fallen behind in that? Why? Did you know at this church we have outgoing ministries? You know, we, we go out and we do all kinds of different evangelical outreaches to communities around here. How many of you have never been a part of any one of those ministries? Why? How many of you are sitting here quietly, saying and doing nothing, while the lies and the agenda of Satan is being proclaimed in our schools, taught into our children's lives, becoming the law of the land in our governments, and are saying or doing nothing about it. Why? Scripture is full of verses that tell us to stand firm, to hold fast. I've got a selection of them up here. I'm not going to read every single one of those. We'd be here till lunch, which we'll be here anyway. <laughs> but look how often, and this isn't all of them, guys. This is just a sampling. God speaks so much about standing firm and holding fast. How are we going to do that? How are we going to stand firm and hold fast if we don't understand the Word of God, have knowledge about the Word of God, and are rightly applying the Word of God in wisdom that we are living wisely? How many people out there are looking at this same body of truth that you're looking at and are misrepresenting it, proclaiming it falsely, and believing it in its falsehood as they proclaim it, as they interpret it, believing lies that cannot save? 
believing a false gospel that cannot rescue from sin. Yet sadly, now even then, there are so many that are holding fast to this lie. And tragically, it is this, this truth that they are misrepresenting or denying that will ultimately judge them one day. It's the same word of God that could save them that is going to be used to judge them. 2 Peter 3, verses 3 through 7 says this. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Peter warns, for when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But the present heavens and earth, by his word, are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. The same truth that they, that they deny or misrepresent is the very truth that will judge them. Why? Because it is folly to deny God. And it is foolishness to misrepresent the truth of God. Everything that we need to know about God, God has made evident and clear. Read Romans chapter 1 three times. Today. No, that's instruction. No. But I understand in Romans 1.19, we, we, we read that God made it clear. God has made himself evident to humanity. You cannot. You cannot deny the existence of God. So then it's only through arrogance and by lies and by deceiving, deceiving oneself that one can look around and say, there is no God. It's a lie of arrogance. It's a fool's errand to proclaim these things. And yet they do because they, they don't want the truth of God. If they understood and claimed the truth of God, they would have to change their lives, give up their wickedness to serve God. And quite frankly, they love their sin more than they fear God. So they create a truth, they create a God, they create a gospel that they can control. Romans 1.22 says, professing to be wise, they became fools. Remember, wisdom is the right application of knowledge. Foolish is the improper application of knowledge. It's, just, it's not that they don't have the knowledge. It's that they intentionally choose to misrepresent it to themselves and to others around them so that they can control the truth to their own benefit. So James here is going to make it clear to us that there are two distinct, distinct and discernible sources of wisdom. If we're going to talk about this application of knowledge, he's going to make it very clear to us that there is wisdom from below and there is wisdom from above. James 3, verses 14 through 16. James writes, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. If this is your truth that you're basing your life on, and that you, are, that you are using to apply to your life such that it's controlling your actions and it is marked with bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, do not boast that that is the truth. It is not. It is falsehood and it is lies. He says it's not the, the, the wisdom, the knowledge that comes from above, but it is of the earth. It's man. It's naturalistic. It, it's the natural state of man. It's not spiritual. It's not from God. In fact, he says here it is demonic. This is the same knowledge and wisdom that, that Satan and his demons would, 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 would espouse and would cling to. Not from God, but from man, marked by jealousy and selfish ambition and pride. What's in it for me? How can I use this truth to best benefit me? He said that tr we know that James has talked earlier about a true faith, a saving faith, an effective faith being marked by good works. Just recently, in the last couple of passages, we were reading how a true faith and effective faith has the ability to tame the tongue. And we talked about how the tongue is motivated by the things that come out of the heart. Well, the condition of the heart is motivated by the wisdom and the understanding that we have of God. So where do we start with this wisdom of God? Where do we start with this process of wanting to know rightly what it is that God has said, what it is that God has taught, and how it is that I ought to respond to this and live my life. Well, as I said earlier, the problem with the world is they love their sin more than they fear God. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. If you don't fear God, 
then where's the motivation to know anything about God? And this is the problem with the gospel. It just says God loves everyone and God's going to save everyone. God does love everyone such that he called you to repent and to trust in him and to change from your wicked ways to following his ways, to give up the ways of man to follow the righteousness of God. First then, James goes on, he talks about the natural state of man as he talks about the wisdom that's from below, the natural state of the heart, the natural knowledge of man, as man convinces himself that his existence and his purpose and his destiny are all about himself. This is the wisdom that comes from below. It is first and foremost a greater love of self than a fear of God. I've taught in past sermons about you know, these existential questions that man asks. Where did I come from? What's the meaning of life? What happens when I die? The people of the earth who have the wisdom from below answer all of those questions with the same answer. It's all about me. Therefore, the knowledge, the understanding, the wisdom, the application of all of these things are all focused through the lens of me. How do I make this to benefit me? All information, education, experience is, fo is focused on self. All understanding and the translation of the meaning of this is all focused on self. Therefore, the wisdom and the application is all focused on self. And, and, they, and they look at all this and they go, man, I have got this figured out. I am a very wise person. Look how I've used this body of knowledge to benefit me. And it creates things like prosperity gospels. And it creates things like easy believisms where it's so easy just to, just to check a box and say, yep, you're saved. Yet none of that is true from the Word of God. That's not the wisdom of God. That's the wisdom of the world trying to make things all about me and how I can benefit me. So then their wisdom is all applied to self. And their character, when you look at it, when you really boil it down, and you look at what's underneath that, the character of the works of the person whose wisdom is of the world, is marked by bitter jealousy, selfish ambitions, and boastful arrogance, according to, according to James. Those aren't things of God. You look at those characteristics that he talks about, that, those aren't characteristics of God, nor should they be the characteristics of a disciple of Christ. And then worse upon worse is to take those lies and promote them as the truth. Is a lie against the truth of God. It's not God in them, it's man in them proclaiming themselves to God not holy and righteous. It's of the flesh. It's of the same nature that Satan and his demons would say, I will be like God most high. Wasn't that the lie? You can be like God. You don't need God to tell you what to do. You can be like God. No, you can't. No, you can't. What you can do is submit to God because he is God, sovereign and holy. That's what you can do, but you cannot be like God. And so you see the results of this wisdom. When they, when they promote this wisdom and that becomes the application for their life, we see the, res, the, the, the result of it is this. Verse six, 16, he says, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Look at the world we live in today. Every time, every, everything we see all around us, in the news, the medias around us, is discussions of hatred, division, immorality, sodomy, evil as the law of the land. They are haters of God and idolaters of self. The things that James talked about so long ago is the world we live in today. And it will get worse. And yet God, in his mercy and by his grace, has called a group of people to be ambassadors to this land. And that ambassador is sitting in your seat. Go and serve God in this land. Because this land needs you. People need the truth that you have. They need the wisdom that you have, the knowledge that you have. Don't be silent about it. Share it with a world that desperately needs it. This is the wisdom from above. By contrast, verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This then is wisdom from above. First and foremost, it is a great love of God and a desire to glorify him. 
And it's the exact opposite of the wisdom of the world. It says the, best, the goal of man is to glorify himself. The wisdom from above is the goal of man is to glorify God. Luke 10, 27, the Lord said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. It's really, you know, we see, yeah, we hear that a lot. You know why we hear that a lot? Because we need to be reminded of that a lot. Because we don't do it a lot. And we need to do it more. Loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. This is the, the, the true knowledge of God and the prudent understanding of God. Because understand that both the person working from the wisdom of the world and working from the wisdom of above will both have works. You both will have fruits in your life, but there is a tremendous difference in the nature, the character, and the results of those works. The person living in the wisdom of the world lives to glorify themselves. The person living from the wisdom from above lives to glorify God. I can't put those any further apart. Love of self, love of God. Focused on what can I, what, what's in the best interest of me versus what's in the best interest of God. We look at these patron saints of the past at their sacrificial lives and go, how do they live that way? because they weren't the person on the pedestal of their life. They lived their lives to glorify God. And if that meant personal sacrifice, then that's what it meant. But the focus of their life was to glorify God. To answer James's question, who is, who's wise and has understanding among you? Well, as he says, it's the person of a pure heart, not a selfish one. It's the heart who desires to be at peace with all men, gentle in adversity, open to reason with those who disagree with us whose actions are marked by acts of mercy, whose life is marked by good fruits, works that glorify God, a character that is sincere to glorify God, not hip hypocritical, not seeking to glorify man. Therefore, understand that knowledge, understanding, wisdom, all of these, when we have a wisdom from above, are all see seen through that lens of desiring to glorify God. Therefore, all the information, all the knowledge, God, knowledge of God that we bring in through his word, education, experience, we see all of these things through the lens of desiring to focus on glorifying God. All of our understanding, of, uh, as we look at the meaning of God's word, to understand, well, what's the meaning of this verse? Well, the meaning of this verse is to glorify God. Then how then do I apply that verse, which is wisdom, to glorify God in my life? Again, it changes the whole lens as we apply wisdom from above versus wisdom from below. The result of wisdom from above, he says here in verse 18, is a harvest of righteousness, which is sown in peace by those who make peace. A harvest of righteousness. Righteousness is right living unto God. You, you want to see a harvest of righteousness in your life? Live your life in such a way as to understand the meaning of God's word to you, that it is to glorify God in your life, and apply it in such a way as your life, not to bring glory to you, but to bring glory to God. You should, I, I've said this before, I'll say it again, I, I'll probably say it on my deathbed, I hope, I hope I don't ever have to tell anybody, I should not have to ever tell anybody, you should not ever have to tell somebody that you are a disciple of Christ. It should be self-evident. Now there's nothing wrong with going out there and proclaiming it's true, but when you tell them it's true, it ought not come as a surprise. Therefore, he says, the harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. The wisdom from below produces fruit, produces works, and, 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 a, and a harvest that is only good for the flesh. It's only good in the world. But the wisdom that's from above, the understanding of God's word, and the application of God's word rightly in our lives, produce a harvest that is good for our soul. The fruits of the Holy Spirit, if you will. Galatians 5, 22, 23. But the fruit of the Spirit... Okay? If we're walking and applying God's word rightly, we ought to see these fruits in our lives. You ought to see these fruits in your lives. The Spirit of God is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things, there is no law. As, as you look at your life, do you see these fruits? If you, look at, you know, if you put the fruit bowl of your life up here and you're going through and you're checking them out, are these the fruits in your basket? Which one are you lacking in? and seek to serve greater in that area, to see more of that fruit in your basket. This is the wisdom from above, to live your life glorifying God 
and to seek a harvest of righteousness in our character that glorifies God, not self. Next for your notes here, wisdom that works is from above. Now, James has talked before. He says, you know, the faith that is effective, the faith that can save, uh, faith manifested is always manifested in works. So, too, is our wisdom. The wisdom that is effective, the wisdom that is going to bring about this harvest of righteousness is going to be wisdom that works. In the first part of this letter, back in James 1, verse 4, James kind of gave one of the goals he had for this whole letter. He said, let steadfast and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This is, this is God's goal for you, that we would hold steadfast through adversity, because it's easy. Anybody have a trouble holding steadfast when everything's calm in your life? No. No, the ship on the sea is just fine holding steadfast. It's when the storm comes that it's hard to hold steadfast. Well, there's going to be storms in our lives. And when those storms come, and when we put ourselves out there to proclaim God's word into this dark world, this is when we need to be steadfast. And he says, let steadfastness have its full effect, that you be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Man, I wish I were there. How about you? But I'm not. I'm not there. I'm working on it, but I'm not there. That's why we call it a process of sanctification. We're always growing, maturing, going deeper into God's word, going back to God's word being engaged in these classes and studies and, and corporate uh, time of worship, that we can be growing and, and, be, and becoming more and more perfect, more and more complete, less lacking of anything that we need in our lives. And to do that, to accomplish that goal, we're going to have to first need God's grace <laughs> and the leading of the Holy Spirit. But second, you're going to need to work this stuff out. You're going to have to apply yourself to it. You cannot just warm up a chair on Sunday morning and expect to see this happen. This is something you're going to have to exercise. This is something you're going to have to grow, your, your spiritual muscle, your faith muscle. Okay? I'm, thinking, I'm looking over at my, 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 my muscle guy over here with the gym. I'm thinking this is the perfect analogy, right? We're going to exercise that faith muscle. We're going to get out there and we're going to work this thing out. It's not just going to happen, guys. You've got to apply yourselves. I have to apply myself. This is why James declares in the next verse there in chapter 1, verse 5, he says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. God is the source of true knowledge. The Holy Spirit is the source of our understanding, to be able to interpret God's word rightly. Therefore, wisdom is going to come to us from God. If you're like going, man, God, I just don't, I just don't get this, God. I need, I need some help with this. Go to God in prayer. Say, God, I'm not sure what to do in this next situation. Go to God in prayer. God is not going to leave you hanging. He's going to give you a response to that prayer. If we, if we pray with a sincere heart saying, God, I need your wisdom and how to, how to proceed, God's going to answer that prayer. It may be to continue to pray. It may be to go seek some advice from, from another brother or sister. But God's not going to leave you just hanging out there. If you pray to God, say, God, I need your help in this. This is a big decision in front of me. I'm not sure what to do with this. But I will tell you this, that the right answer, the wise answer, will always be the answer that brings the most glory to God. God has already declared regarding asking of him. He's already declared all who seek him with a whole heart will find him. God has already declared that those who forsake him will be forsaken by him. These are some simple truths, guys. Uh, I mean, this is an Old Testament thing, Proverbs 18, Jeremiah, Isaiah, 1 Chronicles 28. I mean, if you seek God with a whole heart, honestly, earnestly, seeking God in faith, God says, you'll find me. He says, if you forsake me, I'll forsake you too. And that's not just an Old Testament thing. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, so everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who's in heaven. Do you get it? Do you see the truth? There's the knowledge, okay? That's the knowledge. Seek God, you'll find him. Forsake God, he'll forsake you. That's the knowledge. Now, do you understand that, okay? One is a truth, if applied rightly, leads to eternal life. The other is a truth, if denied, leads to eternal judgment, okay? That's the meaning I'm just going to give you. That's a freebie. Now, here's the question. What are you going to do with that truth? Because that becomes wisdom or foolishness, how you apply that truth. Having heard it, received it, understood its meaning, how you apply it matters. How the world applies this matters. How we present this to the world matters. 
James asks the question, who among you is wise and understanding? Do you have the true knowledge, the wise understanding, be able to rightly discern who God is, that God is the almighty, all-knowing, all-present, holy, and sovereign God? Do you understand who mankind is before God, a created, a created being, created in the image of God, created for the purpose to glorify God, who rebelled against his creator and declared, I will be like God most high. And all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Therefore, all of mankind lives only in denial of God's righteousness, his sovereignty, and has only the expectation of judgment to come. Do you have the right understanding of what a person must do? How can a person be saved from the wrath of God? As we sing, what can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It is Jesus and Jesus alone who is the Son of God who died on the cross as a propitiation, as payment for your iniquities to atone your sin before a holy God. What must you do? Repent and believe. Submit to this God who sent his son to die on the cross for your sins. That's it. You understand that? Because he says in, verse Romans, in Romans 10, 9, he says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's the knowledge. There, there's the understanding. Now comes the application. This, this is what we need to be proclaiming to ourselves, that we remind ourselves of these things, as Paul said. This is what we need to be telling our loved ones, our friends, strangers on the street, these truths. This is the knowledge that they need to have. And, and if they'll give us the opportunity to explain meaning, great. But ultimately, application, wisdom has to come from them. They have to decide what to do with this. So I'm going to finish off where we started. How are you going to know? And as we talk about us having this wisdom, because this, this question was for us, who amongst you has understanding? Well, how are we going to know? Well, keeping in the, in the theme of James' letter to us, it's in the works. I like that. It's in the works. I hope that your understanding of God's word and I hope your wisdom is in the works. I hope you're working this stuff out. I hope that you're rightly applying God. I hope it's in the works. I hope it's in the works of your life. He says in verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? Well, this is who it is. By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Back in James 2.18, he said, I'll show you my faith by my works. And here in the same way, he says, show me your wisdom by your works. How is it that you are living this out in your life? That will be the manifestation of whether it is wisdom or foolishness. He declares, show me your wisdom is from God above and not man below. Show me that you have true faith and you have true wisdom, an effective faith and an effective wisdom. How? By the good conduct of your life, by the good works that are producing a harvest of righteousness in your life. And as you're doing so, from the meekness of wisdom that comes from a pure heart, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy. And that all of this is to glorify God. That that's our primary focus. As we apply the knowledge of God's word, this body of work, that we apply it to the, in our lives to the glory of God, not to the glory of self. And, and I like that he, he puts this in here because it would be so easy for mankind, because of the nature of our sinful heart, to swell up with this knowledge. Oh, well, thank goodness I am saved and not like that sinner out there. He says, no, your attitude is to be very humble, very meek, very mild. For this God saved you, rescued you, when you brought nothing to the table but your sin. But this idea of being meek or gentle, it, it doesn't mean weak. Being meek or being gentle, it, it, in fact, it's very opposite of weak. Being weak is strength restrained. You have an incredible strength. You have the power of God coursing through your veins, the Spirit of God dwelling in you, the truth of God's Word at your disposal to proclaim to a world that is power. But to do so meekly is the attitude of Christ. And so it is to take that strength and to restrain it humbly. Like so many others in the world right now, we're, we're raising baby chicks. I, I have a camera right now on my incubator watching chicks hatch. I'm not going to look over at my wife right now because she may or may not be paying attention to the sermon. She may be on the egg cam right now watching chicks. But we, we're hatching these little chicks, right? And so we've got a, a little five-year-old granddaughter, and, and we've been handing her, you know, not these chicks, but ones we had before this, and I would hand her a chick, and what would I tell her? Be careful, be gentle. Why? Because she has the strength to cause great harm. 
And so I tell her to be careful with the strength that she has, that she use her strength wisely and restrain it for benefit so that she doesn't cause undue harm or inflict injury. Strength restrained is, is to exercise the strength utilizing self-control. Okay, so I get it. I need self-control. Scripture gives us a reply to this. He says, for God gave us a spirit not of fear but of power and of self-control. 2 Timothy 1.7. Self-control does not come from the earth. It is not a worldly thing. It is very opposite of what the world is going to teach you. The world is not going to tell you self-control. The world is going to tell you, go wild. Have at it. Wisdom is whatever you want. Do whatever is right in your own eyes. That's, that's the wisdom of the world. But we're to told, we are told to have self-control. We've been given a spirit of power, but we are to exercise it with restraint, to be humble, to be meek. God gave us his word. God gave you the, 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 the holy scriptures that you can know, that you don't have to go, you don't have to be ignorant. You can know everything you need to know about God, about the nature of God, about the nature of man, and what it is that, that God expects from mankind. God has revealed himself to this knowledge so that you can follow him. And this is the wisdom that comes from above. You want to apply these things rightly to your life. It's all summarized in this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Trust the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And serve the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, seeking in all ways to glorify him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word that we have this body of knowledge. We, we don't have to just try and figure this out on our own. You revealed yourself and all that you expect from us in your word. We have the knowledge available to us. Holy Spirit, we pray that you will reveal the truth of your word rightly to us so that we can understand it rightly. The rest is kind of up to us, isn't it, Lord? If we've, if we've got the knowledge, we've got the understanding, I have to choose, am I, going to, am I going to apply this to my life or not? Will I walk rightly before you, humbly before you, serving you as the sovereign God of all creation? Or will I look at these truths and understand them for what they say and walk away, desiring to serve myself more? It comes down to a matter of priorities. Father, I pray for me and for all those hearing the message today that the priority would be to glorify you. All that I ever did in serving myself was, earn, was to earn my own judgment, to deserve your wrath. But because of your mercy, your grace, your love, your sacrifice, I don't have to fear that wrath. I can lay that judgment aside and walk, walk humbly, Lord, alongside you. We prayed about that, we sang about the days that's to come. You're going to make all things new. For we will once again be able to be with you, Lord, in that place that you have prepared. Lord, that is a place reserved only for those who have come to you with your in your word, wisely submitting ourselves to you, serving you and glorifying you first and foremost. I pray that for us. I pray that for myself. I pray that for this as a church, that we would be a people that are known for, for loving you, Lord, for glorifying you, as a people and as a body. We want to serve you because you are worthy, because you are God. I love the fact that you have sent us out as ambassadors. Deploy us, Lord. Use us, Lord. Equip us, Lord. Encourage us to represent you well, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. May fall. Though the tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes to you. Though the waters rise, I lift my eyes, I lift there's hope in this heart. I will praise you, Lord. See it out, church, you know it. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The 
joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness of tens, in the shadows I'll see the joy. Say this together as a church body. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority. Have a blessed week, folks. Thanks for coming in. Prayer tonight at 6. Don't forget.